Right, thank you very much. I'm now regretting uh, trying to do the ugliest PowerPoint presentation <laughs> ever. I thought it would be quite a good contrast, but now it just does genuinely look shit. <laughs> it's, in, it's in celebration of the fact that this week is, uh, I think they call it Internaut Day, don't they? The birth of the, the World Wide Web. So I thought I'll go back to the 90s with my styling. Um, I actually have notes. I, I kind of, I think I've overshot a little bit with this. Um, I thought it would be quite good. I don't like talking about stuff that we've done in the past. I quite like talking about stuff that we're going to do in the future, that we're thinking about and we're, what's coming next sort of thing. Um, so I thought we'd try and do that. So I'm going to kind of probably waffle. So please, if I get a shepherd's crook or something if I go on too much. Um, firstly, let me say thank you very much for having me along. I'm like really flattered to be asked to come along tonight and talk, talk to you guys. Um, yeah, like I've got, I've got quite a lot that I want to say. It's, um, when I was asked to do this, it was only on Friday, and uh, thanks Ishbel, uh, and uh, I, didn't know what to, I didn't really know what to say. Um, so as with all these things, you kind of like scrabble around for a bit of inspiration. And the actual inspiration came within about five minutes, actually, from the initial conversation uh, and my initial terror for coming along and talking about something that I didn't necessarily know what I was going to say. And it was, about, it was one of these conversations, and anybody who works in an agency here will have had it, and it'll be something, or it, something around having a crap brief for a project. So a client writes down what they want, and, and then someone complains about how crap it is and how they've sort of decided kind of what they already want uh, before they've asked you, and they've sort of put you in a little bit of a box. And that kind of got me thinking about the design process. Actually, um, it's, it's, Adele's kind of covered quite a lot of what, so I, I can skip a few things, which is quite good. I totally agree. Every designer is a user experience designer, and I really hate, as a digital person, I really hate this kind of pigeonhole for user experience design. If you, if you read any UX blogs, you'll realize they don't know what they're doing, to sort of like trying to justify themselves. Um, I really must, must stop go, uh, sort of going off on tangents. Um, yeah, so briefs. Um, and it got me thinking about the design process. Uh, and, and I thought that would be quite an interesting thing to talk about because in our world, um, I actually think there's a, a bigger issue with, with briefing in that there are, there's, never, there's no such thing as a good brief. Anyway, I'm, gonna go, I'm going, up, going off on a bit of a tangent. Let me introduce myself properly. Uh, my, my name is James Jefferson. Uh, my job title is Chief Creative Officer of Equator. Um, it's a company that I co-founded uh, with John and Gary. Uh, some of you may know them. Uh, seven, it's going to be 17 years this year uh, ago, so 1999 it was when we started. Um, we're now, we've now got a studio with uh, 170, scarily enough, people in it, um, here in Glasgow and one down in London. Um, it's, it's been a kind of an amazing journey. I started out, came up to Glasgow to go to the art school, studied product design, which is where I learnt user experience design, because that's what it is. Um, and circumstances transpired to kind of make me stay. Uh, I, I, I wangled my way in a job in an agency, that agency went bust, I was made redundant, and then subsequently asked to start Equator. Just on the verge, I was, about, I was just on the verge of running away to San Francisco with a flower in my hair, but I got tempted to do this. And actually, as a kind of total geek, I thought this would be quite a good thing. And we had the idea of doing uh, what at the time we called, we thought we didn't have a name, we didn't call it an integrated agency, but it's subsequently become an integrated agency. So digital, but kind of all things digital under one roof. And at the time, that was a new thing. There was, there was nobody doing every bit of digital in one place. And we realized that actually, if you kind of join the dots, that you can do more with it. And it became more powerful. And the th interesting thing is, I think, let me just find out where I'm supposed to be saying that. Um, the interesting thing is, times have changed. Um, and it's been really exciting. I didn't think that, that the World Wide Web was going to last as long as it has. <laughs> Uh, shows how good I predicted the future. Um, I thought, you know, this is going to kind of like, bl you know, blossom, you know, for next five years, it'll be amazing, and then, you know, then it'll become, you know, everybody will be using it and it won't be interesting anymore. And what I think is really fascinating is how the, the, the sort of ubiquity of digital has come to pass. Um, the extent to which uh, these devices are kind of uh, super important to us. And that kind of leads me to um, this kind of concept of where the brief is at. Because the, the brief hasn't changed. You, you still get asked by a company to do a website, for example. We still get asked to do a website. Um, and it, it's always kind of based on a kind of pre-existing understanding that that, that that client has come up with 
about what they want. They have a kind of picture in their head already before they even speak to you in a lot of cases. And that's often the really bit, the biggest challenge. And, and quite often, you know, it's, it's quite difficult to say no because they're offering to pay you to do it. Um, and so, you know, sometimes you crack on and then you realize, you know, you haven't done necessarily quite as good a job as you, as you wanted to. Um, it makes me think that actually a good brief is kind of like a unicorn. It actually doesn't exist. In agencies, we always talk about good briefing, good briefing. It doesn't exist. So what I thought was is look at it in a different way. Let's look at it in terms of as a designer. So talking tonight about kind of digital design or design for digital, I thought it's quite interesting to think about it from the perspective of a digital designer. It's quite difficult sometimes as a digital designer to tell a client that their brief is shite, right? Um, because they might go away. And I've had some briefs, sometimes you get briefs with kind of awful, awful logic in them. Um, one of the common ones is, um, I want a website. And one of the objectives of the website is to drive more people to the website, right? <laughs> So, like, of course there's stuff that you can do on a site to drive more people, to make it rank better and so on, but it's, like, it's a dumb objective for, for you know, to, if you want it to drive more people to your site, to throw your site in the bin to start off with is a kind of really silly idea. So you get that a lot. And what, what, what occurs to me is that there's, there's a, there is the growth in a new way of thinking about things that would actually help designers uh, to, if you like, question what they get as a brief. And my thinking around this kind of starts like back, at the, back in the 60s. So I'm going to go back even before the 90s. Um, my friend Simon is here from when I was at the art school, and he probably knows that I was like really into kind of postmodernism uh, and like the Italian design thing. This is uh, an idea that a company called Archizoom uh, came up with. And I was super lucky. Uh, I, got, when I went out to Milan to work out there for a bit, and I met one of the founders, a guy called Andrea Branzi, and I managed to interview him. He didn't speak English, so he's Italian, and I spoke a little bit of French, so we had to sort of speak French to one another. It was like the most embarrassing thing for both of us, actually. Um, but I was just kind of like uh, in awe. The thing that he had done back in, I think it was 66, was came up with this idea of uh, what they called no-stop city. And it was, it was a sort of slightly satirical idea that in the future, because of technology and transportation, there's no need to have a city anymore people could just move fluidly through a kind of built environment and just sort of stop wherever they want, like a kind of nomad, right? And they had all these kind of wonderful, wonderful examples of, of things. This is the most mundane. There was, a lot of, there was a lot of nudity in some of them. I think it was swinging 60s and all that kind of thing. Um, and the interesting thing about it is that kind of, it kind of went away, that. I'd sort of forgotten about it until the other day when I'd had this conversation about the crap brief. And I realized, actually... This is very similar. This is sort of saying, if, you, if, if Andrea Brancy was given a brief to design a house, this is probably what he'd come back with and then get fired. And what's, happ what's happening in digital is very similar to what they had predicted back in the 60s in the way that our, our ability to move through different spaces uh, or the walls between those different spaces have been completely destroyed. Um, you know, when I started do, working on the internet, we sort of, I'm going to give, away, give up with my notes actually. Um, when I started working in digital, the internet was a thing that you, get, you went and did, right? You sat down and you turned on, your, you lo loaded it up and then you typed boobs in and it came back with some pictures and away you go, right? Um, now it's everywhere. It's, it touches every single part of our lives. It's completely fluid and we interact with loads of different devices and we have different expect expectations of what that experience is going to be. We expect to be able to connect with a brand for example, in lots of different places, and for it to recognize us, almost like you could have a conversation with your friend on Facebook, and then when you meet them the next day in the pub, you can continue that conversation. You expect to be able to walk into a hotel and for the person to realize that you complained about the room when you stayed last time when you walk up to the counter. These sort of connections are all happening. They're all there. But you can imagine what effect that has when you sort of play that against a kind of brief, which is, I want a website that's going to direct more tra traffic to the website. And so what we're finding is, when you look at it, look at the world, um, we're moving away from things like a website and things like camp and advertising campaigns. I'm a big advocate for advertising being killed off. Um, to experiences, and in the broader sense of experiences, um, and what we call moments, which are kind of moments where something interesting should happen, right? And it doesn't matter whether it's on digital or in a physical space. This is a little video about... 
uh, kind of eye beacons. I don't know if any of you are aware of eye beacons. It's a clever little bit of technology which can trigger an action on your device if you're in a specific place. So if I walk into, we're working on a piece for a health insurer. If I walk it, we're, we're rolling out to um, private hospitals all over the UK. If I walk into the hospital, it pops up, knows that I've got, a, knows that I've got an appointment, tells me where to find the doctor, all that kind of stuff. So it, it's sort of really contextual and it's connecting that digital experience with the kind of real world. So we're changing from a mode of saying there's, there's a kind of, um, that digital is a channel into being kind of digital is this, this sort of idea of a connected world where all of these things, all of these um, little moments kind of join up to create an experience. And oh, I, can't I was going to say this. Shit, I shouldn't have dropped my notes. Um, the thing is, yes, I do. The thing is that with all of that, all those, con with all that connectivity and its ubiquity, the, the, the other thing is we care about it a lot because we interact with this stuff a lot. There's a, there's a statistic out there that says we interact with our phones over 300, on average, over 300 times a day now. And there was another thing I read um, from a, a US college where they actually, they, they, they measured the, the sort of psychological impact of taking away someone's phone for a few days. And it was very similar to someone who'd lost a limb, right? <laughs> so... <laughs> So, the, the, and it's real. I mean, that's, that sounds ridiculous, but it's actually real. That's, that is how connected we are. Just because they aren't still on the outside of our bodies, it doesn't mean that they're any less connected than if they were already wired into our heads. And businesses are getting on the bandwagon as well. So um, there was a study by Gartner that said 89% of companies believe that customer experience will be their primary competitive advantage in 2016. That's up in, 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 from last year from about 35%, right? So they're completely changing the way that they think about interacting with their customers. And the interesting, this is where the interesting thing comes in about design, right? Because design for that interconnected um, matrix, that, that, that sort of, uh, that, that, that connected world, as I call it, is becoming very, very tricky. So this is uh, uh, Margaret Stewart talking about Facebook uh, and talking about the challenge of designing these big kind of living systems like Facebook, that they are, they change all the time. And they are, the interactions are so complex and so big, they're actually hard to comprehend. And so to kind of satisfy that, we need a new way of thinking about it. And when you, this is, this is a, I looked at, I found a little piece, this is me sort of digging around over the last couple of days, and I found this is really interesting, there's a really interesting um, a report from John Meder, a lot of you have probably heard of him, very famous um, designer, founder of MIT Media Lab and so on. Um, and he was talking about the difference between the kind of classic design mentality and what's required when we're talking about design and technology. And I thought this is, it's quite interesting because I'd never really made that distinction before. But when you, you, know, you think about this is, this is sort of a nice to have. <laughs> if you've got that person who wants lots of people d directed to their site, if I was able to say that they had hundreds of millions, we would quids in, right? Um, but interestingly, you've got a different thing here, different dynamics. You know, you've got time to create something. Here, we're talking about instantaneous delivery of new experiences and more and more personalized experience over the web. We're talking, and, and here, he's talking about this idea that classic design, and if you're an architect, and actually to a certain extent, my old school you know, product designer or a graphic designer, you're kind of working, you're, 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 your model is thinking about trying to get that thing kind of perfect. You, you guys like, obviously came up against that. And it's really interesting that you kind of went and designed a sort of system around it. So this idea about, about the, the way that the world is changing in this sort of connected mode is that actually there isn't a perfection. It's actually, you can't design with perfection in mind. You've got to design with something else in mind, a different, perhaps a different type of perfection. And I won't, I won't worry about the kind of egos of the designers, but we can worry about that later. Please read that report though, it's bloody brilliant. It's really, really interesting. Um, so there are kind of, there's several different types of things that you can start to think about as a designer to kind of pick up on these things. So I wanted to just touch on, on three of those. Um, the first is systems. So we, we, we're all aware of like brand systems, um, but systematic or systemic kind of uh, digital design is really is becoming really, really important. In fact, it's probably in, in what we do, the most important part of the design process is actually creating a, 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 a toolkit to, to build whatever type of experience that you want so that you don't, you don't kind of launch something and then come back six months later and people have changed it and that experience is kind of subpar. 
The interesting thing that Google have achieved with Material in the last couple of years is they've totally changed the perception of the business from a kind of tech company that's trying not to be evil to um, a company that's actually respected globally for its design, right? And, and, and actually, um, in this little study here, 64% of interview, people interviewed, they ranked it higher than Apple in terms of the quality of the design that they're creating. I think that's a kind of incredible turnaround for, I think it's about a five-year period they've been working on that. The next thing is culture. Um, when you think about this, the, the, con the connectivity outside that brief, the, the culture that, kind of, that, it, that, that, that product sits in is re it's really super important to having it live effectively. And I'm not going to read out, I'm not going to read out because I'm, I'm running over anyway. But I thought this is really lovely. So the best example I could find of the culture thing is um, the importance that Peter Thiel, who was briefing the CEO of Airbnb around their growth strategy, this is his advice to Airbnb uh, about how they should grow successfully, which I think is quite single-minded, it's quite focused, which I quite like. Um, and they went through a whole process of designing the culture and on the basis that if you design the culture well, you, you empower people to be entrepreneurial and make the production of great products much easier. We've talked already a bit about service design and I just wanted to touch on you know, the, gov, the gov.uk thing, which is insane what it's achieved. 3.56 billion pounds worth of savings just through the implementation of these beautiful digital things, which if anyone's like updated their uh, road tax, whatever, it's, it's actually like a joy. You, think, you go into it and think it's gonna be horrible and then that's actually really lovely. And they've got really simple principles, but it's not just about, you think it's about form design as a kind of you know, blinkered designer. It's actually about that whole service from end to end. And, <laughs> I couldn't help. Had to put a GIF in there, right? Uh, and I, I also had to make up another category just to make it work. Um, and, and we all talk about collaboration, but collaboration is becoming m like more the center point of, of design for the connected world. So as a designer in a kind of collaborative environment, you have to work in a few different ways. You have to work as a kind of facilitator of a team. You have to work as a kind of steward of good ideas, making sure that the kind of ugly babies are kind of, uh, kind of grow up and are, are nurtured. You've got to kind of uh, work as a, a kind of, what I, would, I think it's a connoisseur, it's a bit cheesy word, right? But a connoisseur of bringing in good taste. Unfortunately, I'm not very good at that. Um, I, one of the things I found in our studio is the designer as motivator. One, one, I think it's really interesting when you look at, at the dynamic of a, a, of a, a collaborative team. And it, the, 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 the creation of the vision sits with the designer at the beginning of the project. So they're the ones that kind of get, get excited about what they're going to achieve. If they fail to motivate that collaborative team about the, how wonderful the result is going to be, then the whole team doesn't work. You can't have, there's no one else that really kind of, that really drives it in the same way. And increasingly in businesses, what we're finding is there is design at the seat, at the, at the sort of, at the leadership seat in the table where they're actually defining all of those touch points like the culture and the kind of system design. So if you're thinking about kind of what you want to go and train in as a designer, as a digital designer, these are the things you want to be focusing on. And actually, quite interestingly, a, a study found that these are the things that people get trained in in design education at the moment, in order, the rank, that were ranked by students in terms of the, the amount of time and effort put into them. And these were the things that students who had already graduated and were now working um, uh, uh, sort of preferred or, or, or proposed as a preferred bias. So understanding business and finance using research and analytics and leadership and teamwork kind of came out top, although they, they, they appear almost nowhere in, actual, in design education. So I'm going to kind of like, I'm going to shoehorn this in, even though I'm running over time, right? Because it's quite cool. Picture of Barack Obama there. He's, he's signing into law um, the arts into the kind of funded, the funded stream of, of education. Um, and a project that I've been working on for quite some time, which I'm super excited about, I'm going down next week to, a bit like a Barack Obama, sign into law, sign, no, sign off uh, uh, a new college, right? So I've been working uh, with a charity called Creative and Cultural Skills for the last three years. Um, they're a charity uh, aimed at uh, improving skills for creative people in all different creative industries. And I've been talking for ages till I've turned blue about the importance of sort of connected design thinking and connected, connected learning, right? Learning that actually learns, learning that listens. And we're finally going to be able to do it. The government, ha this is part of an 80 million pound government backed scheme to launch um, national colleges all over the country. There's five of them. This is one of them. Luckily, we've already got a building to put it in. This is in Essex, unfortunately, but hopefully it will expand. 
Uh, <laughs> it couldn't get further away, sorry. Um, they keep apologizing to me. Um, the difference that this is going to make is going to be huge. It's based on a kind of principle of apprenticeships. I think I was talking to one, to one of the guys earlier about this. But what it is, is open, connected learning. It's learning that is, is connected to a network of professionals at every level. It's approved and vetted, and the students are, 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 are connected to, in terms of mentoring, uh, professionals throughout their journey. Um, it's based on a kind of community principle rather than educational principle. So you don't leave, yeah? You come back and you mentor the next round of students. Um, the idea being that it never, it never falls behind. So its brief never gets ridiculously out of date. So I'm really, really excited about that and, and, and hopefully, that'll, hopefully it'll be a success. Um, so coming back to that kind of thing <laughs> that I said at the beginning, it's all big talk. It's still going to be shit tomorrow. Um, and I wanted to kind of leave you with the thought that um, actually, I think if you think about um, some of those things that I've talked about, some of those principles of looking beyond the brief in terms of what is the culture that surrounds it? What is the system that I can design to make that product last longer? And what are the connections in terms of those moments of interaction that go beyond that product? Perhaps the answer isn't a website to drive people, drive people to the website. And perhaps we can create a dialogue which is about that connected world, which allows you to open up that conversation without just telling your client, your poor client, that their brief is shite. So the sort of summary, summary of the thing is, as a digital designer, don't, don't feel humble and think you've just got to answer the thing and make it look nice, right? That is not the future of digital design at all. You, you know, you're, you're way more than a pretty interface. It's not about styling. It's about creating something that is delivers meaningful results uh, and has a meaningful impact on people's lives. And I think in this room and beyond, and we talked about kind of Scottish creative community, the power is there. It's almost like a superpower to just kind of see through that brief and kind of see the opportunities beyond it. Don't let yourself down and not actually take those opportunities on. So thank you very much for listening to my rambling thoughts. Um, I, I kind of just put a little thing. This is Tim Berners-Lee's computer that he launched the World Wide Web from all those years ago. And it looked a little bit like this crappy PowerPoint thing. Um, so I sort of put a little thank you to, to him as well for making all of this sort of these conversations and this exciting, exciting adventure that I've been on possible. Thank you very much.